Welcome to Go Figure. My name is Nadeem Makarin, CEO and founder of Gojek, Southeast Asia's first super app. Gojek does ride hailing, food delivery, payments, even on-demand massages. You name it, we do it. Go Figure is a podcast dedicated to expose the inner workings of ambitious tech companies in the emerging world. We like to talk about things we like and talk about things we don't like. There are a lot of myths out there that we want to dispel, so keeping it real is kind of our mantra. Hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, welcome to Go Figure. Thank you. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having us. Um, I'll do a, just a quick round of intro. We have here Niranjan, the legend himself, our CTO of Gojek Core. Uh, we started from the very beginning. 2015. Uh, that's right, that's right. Uh, during those big, big crisis days. And uh, we have here Sidhu, our head of global talent, who leads the India office. Thanks for Thank making it out here. Thank you for having us. So these two guys uh, are, are, I guess, very special to listeners that, that, that don't know. I mean, they essentially co-founded the Gojek, the technology company, together with myself and, and uh, Kevin as well because they created the first, basically, organization for, for Gojek engineering. Um, they started an amazing company in Bangalore in India that we ended up acquiring and then just became our senior leadership. And yep. that's where all the, the history began from. Maybe you wanna share a little bit about your backgrounds and what you did before Gojek and, and why you decided to, to join us maybe a little bit. Sure. So uh, before Gojek, uh, Sidhu and I were running a consulting company out of Bangalore. We co-founded that company in 2010 and it was always targeted as a premium consulting company for CTOs mm. who are going through a growth phase and want to solve difficult problems but don't have enough people to solve those problems. And as a part of that journey, we were partnering with Sequoia, we are their technical vendors. And when Sequoia was looking at Gojek for investment, uh, they in introduced us to Gojek and said that, hey, here's a company who would like your help. And that's Meaning we were in real trouble. <laughs> that's basically, you it's, were it's the, a nice way you, of saying the same thing. <laughs> you were basically Sequoia SWAT team. Don't don't yeah. don't sugarcoat it. You came yeah. to the rescue when companies needed help. Yeah. But. So April 2015 is uh, when we got introduced to Gojek and came in here as consultants to look at what the problem companies facing at that time. And I still remember those days, the demand from people was so high mm -hmm. that the systems were not able to keep up, and there were a lot of challenges. Systems used to keep going down. So we started working on the systems and trying to figure out how we can keep them up and running to serve the market demand. Uh, that went on for a while. And you know, after a couple of months, we were in the bar and you made me a job offer. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you join Gojek? And my response to that was, Dude, I would love to because I can clearly see the kind of things I can do in Gojek and the big company is growing. I would really love to be part of that journey but I have a company of my own. Yeah. And I remember your response was, don't worry about, com about that company, we'll take care of that. <laughs> the solution was to acquire it. <laughs> so that, that, that evening is when he called me saying, hey, you know, milestone achieved. The client just tried to poach me because that was one of our internal gradations, right? If your customer is- Was that a metric of success? Yeah, yeah if your if customer someone tried, How many companies has tried to poach in your agile before? I think most of them that you worked with. Yeah. <sighs> wow. <laughs> so I couldn't, acquire you, so I, I had to acquire the whole company. Exactly. And thank God for that. Turns out your company was way more valuable than you. So, yeah, <laughs> that's what you built. And then I remember negotiating with you, and yes. it was one of the fastest negotiations of which to come on board. But yep. I think the spirit was already there. Yep. I, we could feel that there was a shared intellectual yep. alignment about being that curious company to see what we could become, yep. right? And that was shared. Even though our methods were very different yep. at that time. Yep. And, yep. and I think none of us here in this room would have guessed we would be this big. Yes, oh, um, definitely not. That's, that's the crazy part, right? So the topic of today is about the 10X engineer. The myth, the legend of the 10X engineer. Um, you know, Gojek is now a, uh, you know, top 20th, private company by valuation in the world. So top 20 private company, tech company by valuation in the world. And we're, we're clocking uh, 
somewhere along the lines of nine billion uh, gross transaction val value yep. through our system annually. Um, and then once knowing that, when people find out that we actually have, so how many engineers do you have? 300. <laughs> Three. It's actually a little bit lower than that, but we like to stay at 300 just not to just scare people. Round it, round, round <laughs> round up. We just round up a little bit. We have 300 engineers. Yep. How does that make sense? How does that make sense? And why is it every time I say that number to people outside, their jaw kind of drops? Right. And half of the people are like, oh my God, these guys must be a bunch of crazy quacks and <laughs> they're set to implode anytime. And another half would say like, wow, that's one of the most impressive things I've ever heard. Yep. What do you guys think about that? Like how, how are we, how is this even working? Yep. So, uh, you know, the interesting thing is, I mean, you know, we all get asked this question, right? And, and my answer is, is uh, always surprisingly prosaic to most people. Uh, we study the textbooks and we apply them and if you study the textbooks and apply them, what they teach you is that every engineer that you add increases the risk of you failing to deliver completely disproportionately. Most people assume that if you add headcount, it increases the output, but engineering is strange and that, that's counterintuitive. That With every engineer that you add, you actually slow things down and you slow them down exponentially. So in many ways, and I like to joke about this, right? Like a good finance person, you know a, a, a good finance person because they will look at you and challenge you on every item of spend because they understand that that's how you lose out. Mm. And a good engineering leader will challenge you on every addition of headcount because he or she understands that while every headcount that's added gives you more capacity, it comes at this enormous hidden cost and you really want to justify every additional headcount because you do not want to accidentally create liability, a hidden liability that comes up and bites you in terms of your ability to deliver quickly and to deliver quality. What is this hidden cost? How do you know that it's real? So the way, uh, the, 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 the thing about software is when one person works on software, it scales mm. in terms of the effort that person puts in. But when you have more than one person collaborating on software, it turns into fundamentally a communication problem. So now, in a team, you map the number of communication, and I hear I'm quoting the textbook, right? There's a 40-year-old textbook on the topic. Every person you add exponentially increases the number of combinations of communication that you need in order to agree on what exactly it is that you're building. And the most foundational aspect of that communication is the code itself how one engineer communicates with another in terms of what they're trying to build is best encapsulated in the code itself. So now this combination of increasing, exponentially increasing communication channels with the primary medium of communication being the code itself means that as you add engineers to a team working on a project, their productivity starts going down exponentially. And we actually tracked and mapped this once uh, on, on uh, you know, many years ago, where we saw we, uh, you know, this was a, a very, the person I have enormous respect for, the product manager. He started tracking the output of teams, and he tracked it while tracking the addition of headcount. Mm -hmm. And what he found was that up to four people on a team, it scaled linearly, then it started plateauing. Five, six, seven, eight, and then it starts dropping. And then it starts dropping exponentially. Mm. And so he came up, and, and this varies depending on team to team, project and to project. And the threshold was about five people. Was about five people, though. Uh, you know, I should caveat that 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 depends uh, on the context. Right. Uh, but it doesn't go up significantly beyond that. It it doesn't get. There's no context where you know, five hundred people can collaborate. Mm. Right. So it, it it's it's very low. It's shockingly low. And so what he did was to slice and dice the system in such a way that at any point in time, each subsystem had a team of four people working on it and no more. And this meant that he was literally defining the system architecture to ensure that he had small teams, which at the time was mind blowing for me, right? Why are you deciding system architecture based on team structure? Mm -hmm. And it took me many years to slowly start internalizing the truth that your system architecture and your team structure are the same thing. I remembered we had this debate about this many years ago. Yep. Um, yeah. And I was extremely surprised to see that you were choosing to map 
out system architecture yep. based on what a five person team can do. Yep. Yep. That's exactly right. What. Instead of mapping, okay, here's a task. We need X amount of people for yep. this task, yep. which to me seemed super weird initially. Yep. And I only learned about the benefits later on, but um, I, I, I found that extremely fascinating. Yep. It's a, it's a communication mean, problem fundamentally. Mm. And okay, so that's on a team basis, yep. right? But f as an organization, do you find that there is a similar diminishing return with the number of pods that you have? Yep. So what, what's the reason that Gojek grows its, good, its engineering department in a very, very paced way? Like, is it, is it because we just, can you have an infinite number of teams of five and you'll still get great returns? Or do you then hit other types of diminishing returns? So once you essentially start having multiple pods, just the way you have to worry about in a larger team, how many communication channels exist between team members. When you have a large number of pods, you need to worry about how those pods communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. And remember, these pods are still communicating primarily through the medium of the underlying software itself. Right. So as the complexity of the system itself increases, your ability to add pods is starts to get limited by the ability of those pods to understand the system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So number of distinct problems you can create where there are multiple pods who are working independently and have to collaborate, you know, maybe once in once in two weeks or once in a month mm. to get on the same line, you are good. But when your systems are small and as things are growing, if there are multiple pods who need to work on the same problem, then it becomes problematic because then everyone is trying to step on each other's toes and everyone is trying to evolve the system based on their understanding of their part of the problem mm. without understanding what is a larger picture. And, and their local goals. Yeah which may be very different from the overall global goals for the system. So are you trying to say that there is a natural rate of onboarding that the whole organism needs to have? The organism, call it uh, yep. the organism of the engineering department yep. that's a in, great in analogy. any company, yes, right? Absolutely. Organism. There is a natural rate of onboarding of an additional resource because of this communication and complexity problem. Absolutely. And as your organization becomes bigger, the complexity is driven by the interdependencies. Absolutely. And yeah. as those become higher, you actually have to be a lot even more careful. Absolutely. This is super counterintuitive though, because as you've seen many times before, and we had massive, massive fights <laughs> about where I've come in and I'm just like, look, we have a hundred things to do. Why yep. can't you guys just freaking hire yep. smart engineers? Yep. I mean, and I couldn't understand it. It's like like everything else in life, when you need something, it's like we had funding, we had the ability to hire. Why aren't you doubling your engineering capacity? We're looking at smaller companies yep. than us yep. with double our engineering Yeah, I mean, I, I remember one argument where you were literally like, don't slow me down. Why are you slowing me yeah. down? Yeah, I took it personally because I feel like you guys were this idealistic, pie in the sky, you were like these philosopher, poet, engineer, right. <laughs> okay? At least that's how it felt like it in the beginning. And that you were so idealistic that you did not have an empathy to the, to the business goals that yep. were gargantuan yep. to our challenges. And only over time that I quickly realized that no, it's actually, you were trying to get to the same place that I wanted to. Yep. You just had to educate me about this is not how it works. Yep. It's not. 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 equals like 10. It's yeah. like it can, you can actually go negative. Yes. That's super interesting. Yep. So typically what I've seen is growing your, doubling your organization or maybe even stretching it, tripling your organization in a year is healthy. Going beyond that essentially starts adding all those problems because people don't get onboarded fast enough. Yep. They don't have clarity on what they need to work on. Yep. And even you can't even slice the systems appropriately and fast so that you can create those independent pods mm. to evolve. So, so one of the constraints that that problem adds is there are certain scaling thresholds in terms of headcount and system architecture, because those are tightly, tightly coupled, where to be able to support the next level of scaling mm -hmm. in people will require a fundamental re-architecture of the software stack itself. So there was this uh, a pivotal moment for us, for example, was the introduction of Kafka mm. into our stack. The reason that was so critical is that enabled a restructuring of the entire system to reduce the number of communication channels between teams to solve problems. And until we were able to pivot the entire stack and re-architect it to use Kafka, adding more people would just cripple us. Why? 
the 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 way uh, what Kafka did was it it uh, it sort of applied a reverse Hollywood principle. What's that? What ended up happening in in Gojek in that at that point in time was you would have all these teams with these interdependencies, right? So for example, I want to ship live tracking. Mm. And in order to ship live tracking, I need to know driver locations. Now, I'm not the only team. There are 10 teams, you know, including pricing, including uh, incentives that need the exact same data. Now, until we could re-architect the system to give all those teams the data in a manner that doesn't block the team that owns the driver location system, adding more people to the whole system would just bottleneck it even worse. Because that's crucial data, everyone needed it. And putting Kafka in allowed us to get to a point where it's like, look, now we have a feed of all of the data. Whoever wants it can tap into it without coming to me and asking me for the data. So it seems like there are these lists of enablers that allow your engineering organization to scale. The yes. first is what we just identified is creating system architecture that allowed for five-person pods yes. to yep. take discrete chunks yep. of your system to do it. Yep. The second thing that you're alluding to is actually refactoring yes. entire monolithic systems to begin with. Because yes. as with all startups, when you start, everything's it's monolithic. Yep. Everything's this one gigantic, ugly yep. architecture. Because yep. yep. everyone's just trying to yep. race time. You know, yeah. you got to show your numbers so you're building on this yep. highly inefficient monolithic model. And so until that gets refactored and broken again yes. into different components, you just can't put more people on it. More so people on it. That's a classic example, right? And actually, if you look at how Gojek has grown, that is exactly how we have grown. Uh, for example, Gojek started with a monolith called Stanmarsh, mm. and we first pulled out allocation system out of it, mm. which matches driver to a customer. Yes, the market, what is now called marketplace. What, what is now called marketplace. Yeah. And once that system is pulled out, now you can staff a complete team on that because they can focus on it. Mm. Similarly, GoPay initially got built into Stanmarsh, which is a monolith. We couldn't staff more than two people on that mm. because they had to understand the entire monolith. But we essentially refactored and launched GoPay 1.0, where we separated GoPay out of the entire monolith. And now there is 40 people team just working on GoPay, which is then further you know, segregated into multiple components. Mm. So, that's how we have grown historically and that's how we'll continue to grow as well. We'll identify a problem, pull it out, and then establish a pod around that. And how, I mean, is it inevitable to grow that way? I mean, that created so much tension between us in the beginning of, of how do we get out of the system. And every time we wanted to grow and do something else, you were always telling me, no, we got to get rid of Stan Mars first. We got to <laughs> get rid of this monolithic system first. And and. Is every startup or tech company doomed to repeat the same thing? Or is it actually possible to get it right from the beginning? Uh, no, it is not possible to get it right from the beginning. Or, or if I may, it's inefficient. Exactly. Mm. Because when you want to start, you want to start as a monolith because when you have one code base and one monolith, it is easier for an engineer to hold entire context in the head. Right. And it's worth calling out that at this stage of the business, you have maybe 10, 15, 20 engineers. Mm. So you'll see that the and they're all sitting together. They're all sitting together. They know exactly the, the reasons of why a decision was made. Exactly. Yep. Right? They have full context. Yep. So the communication overhead is very low. And extending that further, right? Uh, you essentially carved out certain system from monolith. Over a period of time, that becomes monolith. For example, ride service, right? Which is an auto management system for our transport. Mm. When we pulled out ride service out of Stanmarsh, it was pulled out as a small system to just handle transport. But as transport grew, and number of use cases in transport kept on increasing, ride service became now the has new become Stanmarsh. a monolith. It was mm. the new Stanmarsh. Which you now need to split again. <laughs> so it's almost like you, you create these extremely fat cellular structures yep. within this organism. And the more people that connect to it, the fatter it gets, yep. until it split. reaches that critical mass where you have to break it apart again. Exactly and so on. And this is happening in parallel, in real time, across multiple shared services yes. in yep. your organization. So you're refactoring your teams and your code bases in lockstep, which is what makes this so hard. And so, what, so what's happening? If, if, if we imagine that we had a set of m monolithic engines, which we did and stuff like that, what would have happened if before those got broken down and before the pods got segmented in the yep. way that we did, 
what would happen if we threw like in another hundred, like I say, another hundred engineers on on right. these problems? Like, run me that scenario. What would actually happen in the day to day? So, in practice, what ends up happening is, um, and Shobit actually calls this. Uh, he has an interesting term for this. Uh, Shobit's a, a colleague of ours. Um, We're gonna have him on the show. We're so gonna, yeah. yeah. So, so he calls it. Uh, he, he jokingly calls it relationship as a service. Right? So what ends up happening is I have a dependency on your stuff. Now, I need something done in your system. You have your own priorities. Now, I need to convince you to prioritize something that I need, so I'm unblocked. Mm. Now, this, this set of demands starts growing and growing and growing until you're no longer able to do your work. You're completely bottlenecked trying to unbottleneck other people. Because people are trying to access my system. Yes, constantly. And, and, you're and then constantly I have to like, serve you. Yes. I get an email from you or a WhatsApp saying, yes. hey man, I really need this. And exactly. so I can't get my, exactly. my stuff done. And, and then what ends up happening is because I know you, I'm going to come to you and at a personal level convince you that what I need is more important. So now this starts create, taking what is relatively a simple system and starts turning it into a bureaucracy with back channels. Mm. And then you start having what Shobit calls relationships as a service. There are certain people in the system whose relationships allow other parts of the system to scale by giving them a back channel, a priority channel, to jump the queue. Hmm. But this inherently doesn't scale because eventually all the other people who do not have access to the relationship as a service start to get extremely frustrated. And they start calling the organization political. Exactly. exactly. That's when you say, which, yes. which we experience yes. that, right? Even at our very modest rate of growth, yep. We've noticed how very quickly those privileged access people yep. and the lack of access by a certain other set of people created the perception of politicking. Exactly. When it's actually just traffic congestion. Yes, and right? everyone's just trying to do their best. Exactly. And because they're trying to do their best, they're going to use everything they have unconsciously, which includes those relationships. Like, you know, because I hang out with you, you have more empathy for my problems, so you're more likely to prioritize my requests. Mm. That's really fascinating. It's almost like a lot of people accuse organizations of being bureaucratic and political when even in the most well-intentioned and non-egotistical organizations, structural failure leads to the perception of favoritism. Exactly. Yep. That's super, super interesting. But we're, I mean, we're talking about an engineering organization here, but then, you know, what are, what are some of the things that we can do to unblock? or to de-bottleneck. You mentioned the stuff on architecture, you mentioned stuff on pods. What about the people themselves, the engineers themselves? Like, is is the quality, is there such a thing as a 10X engineer? Is this a myth? Is this, uh, like, how does this factor into, why is our acceptance rates for engineering so low? Like, among the lowest in, in, in various comparable industries and, and other ones. Does that play a part also in, in increasing the efficacy yep. of once they get onboarded? I mean, wh yes, very why much. are we so selective? So, so there are two, two axes that are relevant to, to answering this question, right? The first is, you know, we talked about how as the system complexity grows, for you to meaningfully contribute means you need to know the system. Now, there's one scale of develop, one axis of development, which is an engineer who can grasp large complex systems and understand the implications of design choices on scaling that system. That's a really tall order, man. How can a 21, like, 21 year old, either Itebe or IIT grad, we, we, like, we, understand so complex that's, that's systems? I, I'm actually glad you brought that up, and okay. that's why at this stage we're doing uh, Go Cloud. And I'll circle back to that, right? Okay. So, what is happening now is our systems have reached sufficient complexity that someone who's relatively young and inexperienced cannot meaningfully onboard onto that system quickly. It mm. takes months and months and months and months mm. because the complexity is so high. So what ends up happening is one axis of capability that you need to hire for is the ability to deal with deep system complexity, to know what the ramifications are technically, and to understand how to mitigate those ramifications. That's a core technical skill. The second axis is the communication channel, and that, that's actually equally interesting to me personally. 
right? This is the first first channel is broadly what we would call computer science. Sorry, just when you say it, because you're using some jargon here called yeah. channel. You're talking about criteria. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes, sorry. So you're, yes. that, internally we call it channel. Okay, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So criteria to select an engineer. Yes. Go ahead. The first. Yeah. Thing so the is, first channel, uh, the first criteria is what broadly we would call computer science. Hmm. The second set of criteria is what is popularly called software engineering. Now I mentioned earlier that. The primary tool of communication between engineers, aside from your uh, stories and your documentation, etc., those are the minority. The majority form of communication is the code itself. The way the code is organized, the way the code is written, and, and the focus here, the, the first set of criteria focuses on how well you can write code so that the computers run it well. The second set of criteria focuses on how well you can write code so that other human beings can grasp it well. How well do you communicate through your code? And this Im impacts architecture, uh, you know, it, it has very wide ramifications. And as your system grows and scales from monolith and outward from there, your ability in the second area is extremely important to scaling the organization and system because otherwise, again, you wind up with traffic congestion because badly written code is one of two things. Badly written code is code that doesn't run well on a computer. Mm -hmm or it is code that cannot be easily understood by other human beings. So it's a communication problem. And so on that second point on the communication problem, a badly written code is, is can, can you just double click on that? Does that mean that when I look at your code and it's a badly written code, I didn't understand the why? Yes, you don't understand my intent, you don't understand my objectives, you don't understand what I was trying to achieve, why? So conversely, well written code provides contextual logic. Yes. Yep. Almost. Wow. I, I had no idea about that. Uh, so, and more than just the why, the other part of it is if you look at the software, specifically software in a startup like Gojek, where the ecosystem is changing so fast, mm. one of the most important criteria for the software is how fast you can change it. Now, if you cannot read that code and understand what it does, your ability to change it as the market demand changes is crippled. Is crippled. Mm. And then you really and, start, and that's a reading exercise. It's literally like reading like a yeah, like a book. Yeah, absolutely. Right, and understanding. Okay, it's the 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 syntax. Yeah. The grammar, the yes. logic. Absolutely. Uh, the, the names. The choice of word. The absolutely. diction. Yes. Absolutely. Right. So when we when we you know we run a boot camp because of this complexity, right? When we onboard young engineers, junior engineers onto the system, we one of the first things we teach them is the importance of naming. Mm. Because the first thing that someone else looking at your code sees is what you've named things. And when you read a name, you take away meaning from it. Mm. And if you've named something unwisely, the conclusions that the reader draws could be very, very wrong. Mm. So you, you literally, the, it, it starts at that foundational level where you need to name things in your code well so that, and the concept is called express intent. It's a rule where we say, when you write code, it must express intent. Mm. So on this point, right, like we hardly pair these days, but yep. back in the days when we used to pair, I remember we have spent 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, just arguing about what this method should be called. And, and the return on that investment is immense because the return on that investment plays out over the entire life cycle of that code base, which could be years. But I don't understand because that's just that's a shared terminology between people that work with each other all the time. So, How does a newcomer come in and be able to understand the vernacular of that specific so, so one of the things that engineering we, department? So one of the best practices that we attempt to drive and follow is every code base comes with a glossary. Mm. Because there is a term which means something specific in this code base. Mm. And it may be a business term, it may be a technical term, and it's a label at the end of the day. We're picking a label from the English language and we're loading it with meaning that is very specific to this context. Mm. If that label is poorly chosen, then your communication breaks down for the entire life cycle. And it starts with something as simple as that. And when you, you know, I think for those that don't know, in, in Gojek Engineering, if you, if you apply for a, uh, a Gojek engineering position, you uh, are essentially forced to take a written test yes. as part of the, and then you that also the have, a, yep. you, that's the first step, and you also have a pair programming test. Yep. Yep. And part of the, you know, I think one of the things that I've noticed that you know, we encountered a huge amount of friction with senior, senior yep. programmers initially <laughs> that were, you know, 
forced to take this kind of pretty not rudimentary, but it's a it's a standardized yep. uh, and, and, and coding the, and test. And the problem is trivial. So most people were stunned. At, Why are you giving me this trivial problem? It's a yeah. high school problem. Yeah, yeah. And 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 in reality, that kind of somewhat offended some engineers. But yeah. I think you know you guys defended it to the death. And why is that? Why were you so adamant that every single person we hire, whether they're CTO level or whether they're coming out of grad, we need to see their code? Yep. Well, as a programmer, the best way you can express yourself and is through code. That is what you have been doing for years. Now, what we are testing in that particular test, particular coding problem is not, can you solve a complex problem? But we are testing, what is your discipline? What are the basic criteria you have in your head when you express yourself? So how you structure your code base, how you commit your code, how you write your test cases, how you write your documentation in the readme. Mm. So those are the basic things, those are the hygiene factors. So we are specifically for senior programmers, we are looking at how good is your hygiene? Because that is the hygiene you are going to enforce on your teams mm. once you come in. That is the standard. Yeah, exactly. It, it fundamentally allows you to assess their ability to communicate through their code. Mm. And that is extremely important uh, for us because the rate of growth we were dealing with was like 10% week on week average. That meant that you know many of our subsystems were seeing a doubling in their overall load every two weeks. And that meant, yet again, the half-life of some of our subsystems in the early days especially was one quarter. Mm. So now if you have to refactor your systems at that crazy rate, the whole thing is not sustainable if this is missing. Okay. Okay. So then, based on all of your interviews that you've done, all of the pair programming interviews you've done, all of the code tests that you've done, tell me the difference between a good engineer and a 10x engineer. Sure. What are the biggest differences? Well, okay, let's drill down into that, right? Uh, the 10x engineer itself and their role in an organization and how that pans out. By definition, 10x engineer is an engineer who can produce 10x outcome than an average engineer. Yes. By definition. Is it meant to be I think you, literally? you picked, a li picked a word very th thoughtfully there and I want to call that out, right? Outcome, yeah. not output. Yeah. 10x outcome, meaning the impact. Correct. As opposed to... The amount of code they churn out, they for example. Out. Yeah. The qual so it's the quality of the, the out impact. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Now, if you look at this particular attribute, specifically in the early days of startup, when you are 5 people, 10 people, having these kind of engineers are definitely useful because you can move fast, mm. they just riding on that. But as your organization grows, what you care about is not that individual person's outcome, you care about the team outcome. Mm. So even if you have 10x engineer, but if that person is going to piss the entire team off and cannot work with them, that person's outcome is diluted. How much would you discount an individual contribution in engineering department? in our engineering department. Is there any value hmm. to a solo performer? Or is it really their their team output and how they can contribute to the team? How there much are, of it how much of a team sport is this? Engineering. It's completely a team sport. It's completely a team yes. sport. So there are areas where you can isolate a particular problem and give it to that person who cannot play with the team, but there are very, very small number of problems. Hmm. Right? Because one other term which is constantly used in software engineering is called this term called truck factor. Cut factor. Truck factor. Truck factor. Right? How many people in your team, if got hit by a truck, the entire thing will collapse? <laughs> That's why it's called a truck factor? Yes, it's a redundancy <laughs> basically, right? Okay. Sorry, sorry. How many people get hit? Sorry, sorry, sorry. So if you have... Let's why say is it a truck? Because it gets hit by a truck. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So if you have... Team if of a truck people, factor of three is... Good. Truck factor of one is really bad. That means that if any one person on the team drops out, they fall ill, they leave, whatever, you grind to a halt. Okay. So, all so it's all redundancy. It's, it's a factor of redundancy, redundancy. right? Yeah. Exactly. So, so I, I also want to call out here that an in, the individual contributor aspect needs to be nuanced, right? Because the, there is individual contribution which where the person works alone, but their software fits with everyone else's. Hmm. 
Hmm. So you can have a deeply, deeply technical person, extremely capable, hmm. who has immense, immense contribution. Without working with a team on the people side, but because the team and the software is tightly coupled, as long as their software fits with everything and evolves, co-evolves with everything, you're fine. There's nothing wrong with that. What Niranjan is talking about is let's assume the situation where that person is hostile and toxic. Right. And is contributing to communication breakdowns by their attitude. That's a problem. But an individual contributor who says, look, I work best alone and I am going to work best alone because I am deeply, deeply capable in this area and I can kick ass. Hmm. As long as what that person's building fits, melds, and co-evolves well with the overall system, that's perfectly fine. Okay, so you're talking about a, a, a disruptive force, a yep. negative team force. How do you spot that in a, in, a, in, a, in a new hire? What are some of the telltales? Well, one of the biggest thing is every good engineer is highly opinionated. What we look for is you have strong opinions. Are they weakly held or are they strongly held? If you have strong opinions which are strongly held, which means that if I present an evidence that your opinion is wrong, you still don't budge, mm. that's a problem. Whereas if you see a rational argument and you say, oh, now I see my opinion was wrong, let me change it. Mm. That ability to change and mutate is very, very critical. The other thing that we look for is because as a dev, what ends up happening is your code represents you. It's like a artist painting represents the artist. Mm. It's it's very close to your ego and your self-image. Right. If you are unable to deal with criticism of your code, that's a smell. You'll never get better. You it's like, a, like a script writer, if they're not open to getting feedback from other writers, yeah. etc., they will never be able to get that beautiful final edit, right? Exactly. Because yeah. of the iterative process. Yeah. And, and one of the simple hacks that we use is we just ask someone junior to interview that person. And just seeing that reaction of like a young kid yep. talking yep. to the senior guy, how how offended or how how gracious yes. can that that's, leader that's a great be adjective. in front of this Correct. kid is extremely. So crucial. you just you just you like to mess around with people <laughs> these kind of psychological no, I, tests. I mean, it, <laughs> but they're the, the, effective the, though. No, yeah, it's not just effective; it's part of the playbook. You will find right. that most mature engineering organizations do this hmm. because what ends up happening in reality on the ground in any team is you have seniors and you have juniors. And the seniors have to grow and onboard the juniors on this system, which has enormous inherent complexity. Mm. And then has even more complexity on its boundaries where it integrates with other systems and other teams. And if they can't be gracious about it, then those kids are going to stagnate and then go toxic. Mm. There's a flip side as well, right? There are times when senior needs to get onboarded by juniors because a senior person joining a team of juniors. And you should be okay with that. And in a fast growing business like ours, that's actually the norm. We routinely wind up in situations where you have, you know, younger people owning very complex systems and then you bring in senior talent because you've grown to a point where you need it and then you've to onboard them. Why does why does ego seem to be such a recurring theme here? Um, it, it, it seems to me even more acute hmm. of a requirement to have a everyone has an ego, but I'm talking about an, a control. Yes. ego, uh, which implies that you still have the curiosity to learn new things and be able to admit when you're wrong. That's yep. essentially what we're talking about, right? Absolutely. Yep. Why is that even more important for an engineer? Isn't it? I mean, I think most people coming from outside who don't understand engineering would probably just assume, hey, you either code, it works, or code, it doesn't work. Yep. You should immediately get feedback on whether what you're doing works or not. But it's not that simple, is it? No, it, it isn't. It isn't. Because it's not just about whether code works today or not. It's a question of can you keep evolving that code? Mm. And in any given situation for any problem, there are at least five, six ways that you can write code to solve the problem. Which is the best way is often subjective. And whether you were right or not is something that will only play out over years sometimes. So, classic example. Yeah. I was going to talk about Linux. Sure. Mm. Right. So, classic example of that is the person who built Linux operating system, extremely opinionated person, and at times extremely brash when interacting with community, mm. because he wanted to evolve system in certain way, and he was the core contributor and core committer, keeping 
making sure that each contribution which is coming in adheres to certain standards and his rules. And he got feedback from multiple people that today you are owning that system, but someday system is going to outgrow you. Mm. You are not going to be able to hold that entire complexity in your head. And you need to think about that. And uh, was it a few months back when he yes. replied, when he essentially wrote an email to the community saying that, hey, when I look back on what I have done over the years, today I understand that things are becoming more and more complex and hence I am going to change my stance. Right? Because the system mm-hmm. is bigger than you. The same reason why it is part of our company culture is not about you. Yeah. Applies so for the you. audience uh, and the listeners that don't know, our first and foremost uh, c- company value is it's not about you. Yeah. That's uh, yep. not just for engineering, for, for the whole company. Yeah. Yep. Uh, it's not about you. The yeah. yep. same thing applies for engineering as well. Right? Uh, if I have proposed a certain system and certain architecture, people don't have to accept it. People should actually, uh, rather I expect that people will give rational criticism so that I can learn from them. And, and the challenge here is because this is still more a craft than a science, there is an enormous amount of subjectivity in those choices. So the reason I mentioned Stan Marsh earlier is one of the choices he was forced to make in 2015 was do I pause everything and take two months to completely kill Stan Marsh and replace it with something else? Or do I let this system continue to scale and live with Stan Marsh and cut it out piece by piece by piece, mm. right? And I think it is, it's extremely hard to, 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 to judge at that point in time what was the right decision. The call he made was, I am not going to do anything that stalls company growth. Right. I don't care what the long-term cost of that is, growth today shall not be stalled. And as a consequence, we've paid a price for Stanmarsh living in our ecosystem for two and a half years after that. And it's a very, very difficult call to make today as to whether or not that was the right call. Mm. And this is, this is the story of our lives. Now, in this kind of a subjective, craft-oriented situation, if you do not bring ego management to the table, it's impossible to move forward. Wow. I, I don't think that only applies to engineering, by the way. I just think it's so much more acutely expressed in an engineering department because your feedback loops are a lot faster. Yep. Actually, yep. you know when you're messing up um, much quicker. If you had to pick, let's say this is an impossible choice and that's why I'm intentionally making you do it. If you had to choose between, obviously an engineer needs to have a certain base level of structure, Mm -hmm. right? That's just something that you have to have in you, right? But if you had to choose amazing experience or great behavioral foundations I know again it's an impossible choice but sure. if you had to choose what would you pick if you were forced to choose between these two options well a question like this a good answer is it depends <laughs> <laughs> damn it <laughs> or, or or both S- yeah it's a problem with dealing with <laughs> rational people in your workplace <laughs> they can never give extreme <laughs> dramatic questions okay because depends there on are what. situations where you want experience because the person, the person has seen that, the person knows what needs to be done. Getting that person in to build that system out and learning for that from that person is extremely important. Mm. Uh, on the other side, someone who has a good behavioral traits, is curious, wants to learn, reads books, uh, can accept critical feedback, that person can grow. So it's a choice between, hey, have you grown? Or can you grow? Also, I can add to that that, uh, and this is something if you read the books is not well addressed because most people don't realize that there is only one mature ecosystem on the planet and that's in Silicon Valley. Mm. There are very, very few places on the planet where you have four or five generations of engineers who've been attacking this kind of problem. So when you come to, when you come outside of the developed world and, you know, our playground is you know, completely well, outside of the valley. Yeah, outside right? of the valley. Outside yeah. of the valley, it's not really developed world because you know it's really there. As yeah, the core, yeah. The most I mean, important, yeah. the reason I, I said that is there are few pockets where, for of historic course. reasons, you know, the Soviet Union, for example, That's you right. find amazingly talented engineers because there were pockets where you know 30, 40 years of engineering. But at scale, it's pretty much just the valley. And when you come to our playground, 
Most engineers are first or at most, if they're lucky, second generation. Mm. So what this ends up meaning is you do not have a choice about hiring for experience. Yeah. If you look at there it, is you, none. There is, <laughs> yeah. there is none. Like how many people in which India is, have which scaled? is why we're so skewed to to younger Correct. experience engineers, yes. so, like so two you, three years of yeah. experience. So so if you read the books, for example, some of some of them um, powerful, for example, mm. talks about saying that look, you know, you hire people for a role, uh, highly skilled, etc. But the moment their fitment for that role goes away, let them go, mm. because you will always hire another. But don't hang on. But that only works in a talent rich, it only works when you're sitting in one of these very successful companies in the valley, you know, say you're sitting in LinkedIn and you have Google next door and Facebook next door and, and Netflix across the street. Mm. But when you come to uh, Jakarta or you come to Bangalore, you know, mm. no one's done this before. Right. Or the people that have done this before, probably you could, you, you know, the low double digits. Well, and it's double compounded for us. Not only have we not found people that have done it before, no one's done what we've done before. No one's done what we've done. As a yeah. super app, yeah. right? So, so, so you're just forced to say that blind. we will teach Mm. And that means that there is a natural limit on how quickly you can scale people, and so you have the strong bias to, to hire teachable people. Well, you run our boot camp. Yep. Can you describe a little bit about what, what essentially is the experience of our engineering boot camp? So, um, the engineering boot camp uh, is divided into several sections. The first section I, 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 is just what we call core engineering boot camp because uh, you, know, you need a name. But what it really is, is uh, structured decision making. Uh, basic coding hygiene, like the basic practices that you would need to say contribute to an open source team. These are standard, these are community standards. Mm. But it turns out these community standards are not common in uh, young markets. So you actually have to teach them. Mm. And uh, most fundamentally, we end up teaching decision making together. So for example, I want to name this piece of code, this variable x. This other person believes that it should be named y. How do the two of us, in this subjective conversation, where the cost and the benefit will only play out over time, and even then may not be measurable, how do the two of us engage with each other to meaningfully decide reasonably quickly? That level of collaboration is something that in, in most professions is learned over years, but over here is non-negotiable to be productive at our rate of growth mm. immediately. And then we do this for three weeks, uh, through coding, it's all hands-on coding. We use the code as a medium to teach these ideas and concepts. There's heavy focus on cognitive biases in these conversations because fundamentally what blocks two people from agreeing in, in these situations is we have biases. And then we follow that up with one module from every department in the company or every focus area. So it doesn't matter what you're actually going to work on ultimately. You spend two weeks learning to build mobile apps. You'll spend a week with our head of design learning to design stuff. Mm. You will spend time working on backend, frontend, QA. So you get rotated security. around. Yeah, so we yeah. Bring, in, bring in coaches from every focus area who will teach a one or two week module just to build empathy. Mm. So now you have an understanding that, hey, you know, when I build this feature, I need to loop in my colleague who's focused on security because he or she is worrying about this stuff which I may not be thinking about at all. And so I need to loop this person in because otherwise these kinds of things happen, which are not good. Uh, another interesting thing, which is, which is a soft aspect, which is covered in bootcamp, which I find really interesting is holding two really contradicting ideas in your head about being proud of your craft. At the same time, being comfortable when someone comes and deletes your code. Yep. Mm. Pride without attachment. Yep. Pride without attachment. How is that even possible? Well, that's what he delivers. I mean, the whole point is, if you don't have pride, mm. you will not focus on producing really high quality code. But what are you, how can you be proud of something that's disappeared? Uh, you have to be proud of the journey. Yes. And right? The, of the that's process. Exactly, that's exactly, exactly what right? we do. You can't be proud of the, the, product, the thing. The thing that exactly. you've created. Because the thing that you've created has to evolve. If you're attached to it in its current form, you will stand in the way of its evolution. Mm. That's a super hard to grasp concept that I think, I mean, I've only realized this in the past like two years or so, but letting go of, you know, the actual thing that made you proud, but instead <laughs> being proud of having gone through. Yes. yes that process yes yep. it's, it's a it's a subtle distinction but it means the world in terms of how you view disappointments yes 
not just in your work life, <laughs> I think in your life, yep. I would say. So, yep. right? One of the things which we talk about, right, a quality of engineer is if you look back on code which you produced six months back, and if you don't think about what was I thinking? How could I, I write this code? Why is this code so <laughs> crap? Yeah. If you don't have that reaction every six months, then you haven't grown. Ah. And this is actually very common. Like this is not And so going back and noticing how bad you are is a fundamental, it's kind of like going, so, so we make going to space and looking at Earth again. Exactly. It's so that moment of realization, oh, now I can see the growth. Yes. So now we actually bake this into the boot camp in a very interesting way, where we block one full day every week to work on an open-ended problem mm. that's completely unrelated to the rest of the course code. It's just a plain vanilla programming problem, and it's the same problem. And we make them repeat the same problem every Monday throughout the whole bootcamp. And we start on the first day of the bootcamp. So before we've taught you anything, you write the best code you can. Mm. And then we ask them to look back and we ask them a simple question. Do you feel more impressed by what you've written personally now? And that's your metric for progress. It's completely subjective, it's completely internal, it's completely self-evaluated. Mm. And we're like, look, this is what will give you that feeling of progress. I encourage you to continue doing this once a week, every week for the next six months, even after the bootcamp's over. Mm. Because that gives you that validation, that feeling that my effort, this incredible amount of work and practice that I'm putting into this means something. Right. That's a, it's, it's a powerful moment, especially for younger uh, engineers. That I Because I've, I've been to a few of these bootcamps and I've, I've talked to them and gotten their feedback. Though I'm not an engineer, I, I can see the excitement and the feedback about these programs. It, part of me is a little bit sad that once they graduate, you know, they don't get to participate in these kind of boot camps anymore because they're just in the deep, yeah. knee deep, thick of things yep. of work. And then you're in the, what we call like the inferno, yeah. right? The grinder <laughs> yep. where you've got business heads putting crazy targets yep. uh, and then the product teams and the engineers are are you know in the grinder trying to think through and solution the problems yep. under extreme pressure, yep. very little sleep. Like this is not all, like, you know, uh, like a utopian environment. Yep. You know, at once you're in, yep. even the most high performing teams in Gojek Engineering have to deal with the harsh reality of time based pressure. Yep. Yep. Right. And so, what have you learned from pressure? You guys have been through the worst. You've been there with no resource in the beginning, together with me. You've been on calls where I've been flipping out at you, yelling all kinds of profanities. Yep. Someone who has no idea what you do, trying to tell you how to do your job. Right. Which was like our first year, I guess, <laughs> right? I was like yep. a de facto CTO of Gojek, which is the worst part of it all. But my point is, what have you learned about what makes or breaks teams under pressure in engineering, specifically. Want to take this? Mm -hmm. So, there are multiple things, right? Uh, engineers do care about impact their solutions are creating, right? Uh, you don't code just for code sake, coding sake. You are writing code to create change the real world. Mm. You are writing code to solve the real life problem. And you are passionate about it. So knowing how your code is changing the world is very, very important. And that's one of the reasons whoever joins Gojek, even today, no matter which office, whether you're in Jakarta, Bangalore, or Jakarta, it's easier because you can see the product here. But if you join Bangalore or Singapore, we essentially make sure that, hey, you have to travel within the first two months to go and see how it is changing lives of millions of people in Indonesia. Mm. And that's what keeps you going. Mm. Right? So, so with, with a lot of engineers, it turns out that you don't need to push them. You just need to give them the rush. When show they them. Show them. When the, the beauty of software is it's utilitarian art, I like to joke, right? Mm. Like when you create a piece of art, its consequences in the real world are immediately visible. Mm. If you make that, that visible impact accessible to the creator, it creates this loop which makes the person utterly driven in a manner that no external force, force can. Mm. So Much more so than in financial incentives, much more so than, than anything. anything. It's, it's, it's the, the drive of the maker. So we had a 
apartment in Kemang village, right, a uh, year and a half back. Mm. And any person who comes in to Jakarta, if one of us is here, we essentially invite them home. And there's a balcony. There was a balcony which overlooks the Jakarta skyline. Mm. You take them there and see. You see this entire area. Every person, literally every person, knows about what you do. <laughs> and yeah. that essentially it's a, it's changes how. Yeah. yeah. And then you are willing to go through any and everything, mm. whether it is working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, doesn't matter. In, in in fact, the challenge that we have often is to rein that tendency in. Why? Because what ends up happening is everyone it gets so driven. The combination of business goals with this kick, this rush, can lead to burnout. Mm. Because ultimately, creating software, creating products is a creative process. Yes. And it's asymmetric in that the value you create is not proportional to the time you put in. It's proportional to your state of mind. In that time you put in, so if you've been working 80-hour weeks for three weeks, your creative impact just crashes. Of course, because if the physiology takes over. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it, we actually flag that, and you know, if you look back on the last three years, the number of times that teams have actually worked weekends or late nights, and you compare that with other companies, you'll find that it's shockingly low. Mm. And it's shockingly low because we actually consider that a sign of mismanagement. Yeah, temporary periods is perfectly okay. It happens. Maybe there is a critical problem. Maybe there's a competitor's pressure. Maybe there's just the team going getting super driven. But beyond a few days or weeks, we start to flag it and and try to rein that in. Right. Because if the creativity goes down, it doesn't matter how many hours you work. The point of software is asymmetric impact. Very little goes in. A lot comes out. And it's negative virality as well because. At the end of the day, this is a human sport, a human team sport. And when you see the guy sitting across from you, you know it's like it's like a like a Delta Force, right, yeah. or like a Navy SEALs team. Yep. If you have a mission combined together, and you can clearly see your teammate whose life you may depend on, yes, is obviously injured, yep. or weakened, burned out, frustrated, burned out, bitter, right? whatever. You are immediately questioning the viability of what your end product's going to be, yep. and yep. so I think that's what a lot of companies do very poorly is understanding that it's not it's, you know, I don't really like the term work life balance because for us it's it's destroyed because yep. our life and our work is is, is the same thing. Yep. But it's about breaks. Yes, it's about breaks, Absolutely. micro breaks and long breaks, yep. all types of breaks. Yep. Are as the essential ingredient to human creativity. Absolutely, essentially. Yep. I mean, this reflects in our policy. Yes. This is why we uh, we have uh, uh, you know I- I on these teams we offer unlimited sick leave on trust. Yes. It's also why in uh, in most of our most of our organization we allow people to take leave without approvals. Right. The expectation is there is a certain sensible expectation. You let people know sufficiently in advance. You've got a backup plan, but provided you've got those two things in place, you are best placed to judge whether you can take a leave or not. Not an approver who doesn't have that context. Right. Right. Because at the end of the day, if when you are working, your heart, soul, and mind are not completely in the game, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. And I think that you know it really offends me sometimes when. People criticize um, uh, tech companies for having quite progressive and flexible uh, types of working arrangements. They think it's like, oh, it's 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 this is some some new age crap whereby people are just not working as hard as they used to back in the day. Right. When actually, the reason why tech companies kind of pioneer this yeah. different, flexible and and balanced yeah. way of working is because. Tech companies were the first, because of product engineering, realize that to harness creative power, to harness innovation, you need balance. Yep. Yep. You need balance, and you need a sense of psychological safety or calm. Absolutely. Right, and that requires you to be at your best physical and mental self yep. uh, at all times. Yep. And it really has very little to do with. The amount of hours you put in, yep. and has everything to do with what you do with the hours that you are yep. in that state of flow, Absolutely. and that you're in full engagement model. And therein lies the way of 
discovering and unleashing the 10x engineer. Because yep. you can have a 10x engineer in there and you might not ever know it because yep. you did yep. not give them the sufficient bandwidth, yep. the sufficient Believe space it. with which to show their art. Yep, yep. Thanks a lot, guys. That was a great podcast. Thank you we for should do us. another one on this again. Yep. Um, it is it is one of our core passions, and we hope that some of these principles get extended to other departments, not just engineering. Yep. Um, uh, and 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 we hope to have you guys on on the podcast soon. Yep. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Thank you so much. Cool. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you liked it. Please hit like, subscribe, and follow us on social media. Thanks so much for tuning in.